So good afternoon, everyone. So this is on rising of streaming SQL. And after this, we have another talk on how customers use streaming. And following that, you will be again seeing me. We'll be doing a session on the patterns, like how you can apply different patterns, because it's sometimes that will help you to map your real world end use cases and how you can make sense out of that. Right. So why streaming? So streaming is very important because we need to take decisions as soon as possible. We don't need to wait for days and years. So you have to take decisions as and when the data come in, or as and when the data is produced, or as and when we first see the data. So that is the main reason why streaming is so, so important. So when you look at Forrester, these are some few words that in the Forrester definition about stream processing and all of this streaming stuff. So we try to identify perishable insights. So some information is very valuable right now, but after five minutes, it may not be that useful, like stock, stock trade information, or even if it is a security breach. The earlier you identify, the better it would be, right? And then you also need to do integration, not just like a batch mode or like ETLs. It's streaming ETL or real-time ETL. You want to do processing and connect systems in real time. All these event-driven architectures are all based on that. And then the orchestration of business processes, like we want to connect the businesses and work them to work, make them work closer. Uh, and embedded execution of code, so we have, it's like more of stream processing is now happening in the edge, in the system itself. Like we don't need to send it to another place to process it. So that is one of these democratizing stream processing all about. And then sense, think, and act in real time. So we all want to do this as soon as possible. So that is the key of this. So what is streaming data? The streaming data is a series of events coming into the system having a common format, right? So the format is not going to change much, but the data is going to change, right? So that is usually what you call a streaming uh, data or streaming uh, events. And when you see all of the data that we have, most of them are, like for example, any data that you take, all the data is streaming in the source. Like, for example, it may be transaction data, it may be data from sensors, or it may be anything that you looked at. It is streaming at the source, like it's generated on a streaming way. Right? Sometimes it, it, it may be the useful of that, it may, be, it may be request and response, but the request has happened, that information, the response has come, that information, everything is streaming. Right? So if we can capture the logs or transaction data, sensor data, traffic data, whatever the data, at the source, then we can process in real time. We don't need to store that and do a batch processing later on. Right? So that is the fundamental of this. Like, so the, uh, the idea is like we want to capture the data early as possible in the pipeline, and we want to identify real-time insights, and we want to integrate systems, and we want to reduce unnecessary storage and batch processing as much as possible. So that is all about uh, stream data processing. And when we try to do these kind of streaming processing, these are some of the architectures or some of the things that we can build or use during stream processing. Like, for example, like event-driven architecture or streaming data integration, streaming data pre-processing. Sometimes we want to pre-process the data before you store it. Like, we want to clean the data. We want to do, do some massaging of that. And like when we get the data, we want to enrich that data by connecting to a data store, getting some information from that. Like the user ID comes, I want to join with the table, get the username and pass it on, like those kind of stuff. Or you want to call a service and enrich your information. Or when the data comes in, you want to do summarization. Like if you're collecting metrics information, you want to summarize that data as and when the data come in, and you want to give more richer information to that. Like you don't want to say, okay, this API is in work, this API is in work, this API is in work. We want to say, okay, how many APIs are in work in last one minute? So that would be more meaningful information going out, right? So something like that. And KPI and alerts. So you want to keep track of what's happening, and then you want to alert if the conditions are going where, not going on the way that we want to. And event correlation. Sometimes one event, you can process just one event, right? So if it is a transaction of $1 billion, it, it may be a significant event that we want to look at. But it may be simple events, right? 
when you look at each of them, it, it may not make sense, like it's a normal thing. But when you try to correlate, it makes sense, like it makes a lot of information. Like if you have bought a diamond ring, okay, that's a normal thing that you buy. But if you're buying five diamond rings in like five minute intervals in, in different geographical locations, it's something fishy, right? So you have to keep an eye on that. So those are event correlations, so that is some of, some of the interesting thing. And also, uh, with that, we also have pattern matchings and trend identifications, like whether this, okay, this, whether this value is increasing, decreasing, or are we at the peak? or if you're going to sell a trade, like if it's a triple bottom, what, what's basically happening? So we want to understand the environment. And just understanding what's happening right now immediately is something, but more than that, we also need to understand, okay, well, maybe understand and predict what is going to happen. So we can be intelligent enough to uh, overcome these situations, right? So overcome the problems that we want to, uh, that we might enter, or, this, or we can use the opportunities and gain some profit out of it. And if we want to do some prediction, we also want to learn when we, when, as in when we process. Like we don't want to be dumb, like we just like learn once and you just apply. As in when the data come in, we want to learn. So these are some of the stream processing operations that you can do. So these are, you can apply this into various fields, like it can be fraud detection, it can be a, a simple notification management, or it can even be uh, analyzing sports or video streams, whatever thing. You can apply all of these techniques in, in that. Like if we just take the stream processing as a market, so it is it, the market size is about 3,000 to 5,000, 300 to 500 millions, and it's kind of continuously increasing at 30 percent rate. So there are some positive and negative factors in this market, right? So analytics, machine learning use cases are shifting towards more streaming. Like the analytics were all batch processing in the earlier days, now things are moving towards streaming, right? So if you take microservices, the observability, so now it's more democratized, like we are not just trying to do all processing at, at the same, it's going, going more, more widespread, right? That is also the reason of IoT, like IoT is collecting lots and lots of data, so if all sensors in the world is collecting data, you can't bring everything to a central place to analyze that, you have to process as many on the edge, and then you have to bring rich information towards the center, then you can make some meaningful decisions, right? So, so that's security analysis, ETLs, like real-time ETLs, messaging are taking. So these are some good trends in terms of uh, streaming market. And there are also some negative stuff. Like, for example, when it comes to streaming, uh, like all other uh, uh, niche stuff, we have lack of uh, profession developers. Like, developers are find it very difficult to understand this concept of streaming and implement some useful system on that. So that's a problem that we want to solve. And then this streaming market is heavily dependent on two segments, like one is analytics and other one is integration. Because we can do analytics on a streaming way, and we can also do integration in the streaming way. So all both comes into this particular segment. Right? So if you want to build a streaming application, how you can build? So there are many ways that we can build this application. Right? Everything has a positive and everything has a negative. Right? So there is not. One, one, one kind of shirt doesn't fit everyone, right? So we have to find what best for each of us. Like, if you, want to if you try to code by yourself, you can customize your application so well that it fits your need. But of course, you have to do a lot of boilerplating, right? You have to do a lot of, lot of glue code. You have to write to connect to that. You have all the connectors and all the processing stuff. If you want to process last one minute window, like you want to collect that information, kind of average, and all of those, you have to write it. So it's, it's a lot of work. So what the stream processors do, most traditional ones, what they basically do is they try to give you a framework of code. right? So you can just implement the logic, and there are some pre-built components, you can just put them together and try to build an application around it, right? So now your coding problem has restricted, so you can, you can only code the, the actors and the data handlers, you know, where the, where the important stuff happens. This is like the big data platform. You have a platform. You are using that platform as much as possible. And it can help you to scale and handle failures, but it is hard to maintain and change. Like when there's a change, when somebody asks you to change, you have to go back and rebuild everything, and you want to deploy it in a distributed deployment, check every stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a massive process. So then there are also graphical editors. Like so graphically, you try to put stuff together and implement a streaming flow. How about doing that? 
That's the cool thing, OK? If you are a primitive user or if you're a business developer, you might like it. OK, I just drag and drop stuff. I connect things. It works. But it is OK for a starter or if you are a system, uh, citizen integrator. But when you are doing real complex stuff, that whole diagram becomes very, very messy. And, and that, that kind of stuff is, doesn't scale. And if you are a really advanced user, you prefer coding more than you know, this drag and drop stuff. And then we also have streaming SQL, which is good for advanced users, because like, you can just type in and get all, all your stuff done. But at the meantime, it is quite easy to understand. It's not like general programming, like it's con con concise. But it also had this uh, disadvantage. When you have lots and lots of streaming uh, queries written in a file, you re really find it difficult to map each through each other. Right? So everything has an advantage and a disadvantage. So let's see how we can use them and uh, get some stuff about, like understand about it. So before we going into, go into that, so this is the history of stream processing, like how we basically ended up in this massive stream processing market. So we all are familiar with databases. So if you are using a traditional database, how would you do? You query the database once in a while to check whether there is any changes. Like all the changes, you put it to a database, and you just query that. Right? So then people move from that to this thing called active databases, where they try to get some triggers out of the database. Right? The database will automatically trigger when there's an input. Right? So that's, that's a step forward. Then from there, this, the, uh, the first implementation was Telegraph CQ, which is basically a long-running queries deployed on top of database. Right? So when you invoke databases, there's a query that you have written. Based on the query, it, it gives you some information. It's not just going to inform everything, but it, whatever the things that matches that query, it is going to inform you. And this one ki kind of split into two stuff. One thing is called the complex event processing. So it is a traditional market where it have the capability of detecting very complex patterns. Right? That is why it calls complex event processing. It's just one or two nodes that you, you, you usually run them. It's not that highly scalable because it's very, very stateful. Because if you want to add, um, identify complex patterns, you have to remember a lot of stuff. So you can't scale as you want. Like uh, SAS, Esper, Cayuga, uh, the CD, which is a co-engine of this. Uh, uh, and a lot of uh, stuff are initiated as the complex event processor, which is a market where you usually use for stock trades and identifying sensitive uh, patterns, those kind of stuff. And then we also have this stream processing market, where it is highly scalable. And it's, you, know, you, you basically build a, a cyclic graph of data flow, and we just try to process the data through that. So there are also a lot of systems that is lag, uh, that using that. They are less stateful. Like, they are mostly stateless. But they stream the data through that in a massively scalable way. So these are the two markets that this streaming pro stream processing actually happened. So these all were feeding into the stock markets, monitoring and alerting, surveillance, all of these segments. And in 2010-ish, these were built, brought into the big data. So we have this Yahoo inventing S4, Twitter's Storm. And all of them are donated into Apache. So that's how all of these came into the big data world. And in the big data, what they mentioned is like, OK, this is like Hadoop, but in real time. We do processing like Hadoop in real time. So that basically helped us to get a wide range of adaptation. And along with this, we also had this Spark, Samza, and Flink kind of processing system. So this is how the streaming market actually began. And the big data world move into SQL. Like now you have HiveQL, Spark, uh, some, uh, Spark query language, which is also uh, uh, SQL-ish stuff. So this real time also move into that. So at that particular point, the both streaming and uh, stream processing, or the traditional streaming and the CEP market kind of merged. And now we're kind of in a world where we have streaming SQL to do those stuff. So there are. If you take all the stream, streaming vendors, now they are adapting this streaming SQL. Some of them are in, in like, uh, so if you take WSO2, we are kind of in the four, four, like front in, in, the, in terms of streaming SQL. But in, when it comes to Storm, they are just trying to do some stuff on that. Like in different ranges, you can see 
people are moving from the traditional code towards streaming SQL. Right, so let's look at streaming SQL and what all of these about, right? So if you take traditional SQL, we always work with a static data set, right? So the data set is static. We run the queries on top of that, and to we get the results. So the responses are synchronous. You send a request, we wait till the response comes, right? The streaming SQL and the stream processing is completely upside down, okay? You store the queries, you don't store the data, you store the queries, and you run the data on top of it. Okay? If things matches, it sends you information. So the response is asynchronous. And you work with infinite amount of data with finite set of static queries. Right? So that is the basic understanding of the normal traditional data processing with the streaming, process, streaming data processing. And this is the Siddhi language that we use. This is one of our stuff. But I'll try to explain how you basically do this stuff so you can get some understanding. So we define an application, a streaming application, and then we define a stream, like defining a table. Same syntax, like define stream. This is a production stream. It has name and an amount. And that particular stream has to get information from somewhere. right? So here we are having an annotation, a source annotation. We are consuming events from MQTT. Some additional configuration parameters can be given there. And then it is consuming a JSON mapping, or the JSON message is being consumed. Right? So if we use a standard format, it can understand that and process it. If you are sending a custom JSON message, then we have to give some hints of how to understand that particular JSON message. Right? So that is the input. And we also can define tables, because streaming, OK, so you can incoming is stream, outgoing can be a stream. Outgoing can be a table as well. You can write, write the data to the table. So that is CTL. You get it from MQTT. You do some processing. You write it to a table. It makes sense. Right? So if you want to do that, so we have a last hour production table. Like, so it, you are trying to keep last hour production information is in a table. Uh, and it has a primary key and a store in storage integration. So this table is an RDBMS-backed table. And that also has some SQL-ish table definition. And if you want to write the queries, the, the SQL is kind of upside down here, because to, to, to emphasize the streaming nature, like from production stream, if the amount is greater than 10, OK, get all the data on that. And consider the last one minute batch windows, like last, so last one hour batch window. Last, just take last one hour batch. And I want to get the name sum of amount as cost, and I want to group this sum by name, and I want to insert the results into the last hour production uh, table. So every hour, one or many events by number of groups will be inserted into this particular table as a batch. Right? So every, at, at every, every one hour, you basically push that in. So this is a simple scenario of, of demonstrating how you can write a streaming query. Right? So this takes you away the complexities of connecting to different sources um, uh, or connecting to the databases. And now, if you, run, if you want to write this time batch window in Java or any other code, you have to do a lot of work. Right? You have to remember the data in, so, or how you want to do this sum average, and all of this is a little complicated. Right? So all of this has now just become a very small piece of code. So this is the advantage of a streaming SQL. And it will be more useful when you have more complex things, like okay, identifying a pattern, how you can write that. So we'll look at that in the pattern uh, on, on the third um, uh, session. So, uh, so these are some basic stuff that we have as of now. So what are the challenges with this framing SQL? All right. So some of them is, as I told you earlier, it is not that easy to visualize sometimes, because when you have a lot of streams and a lot of queries. And even if it is SQL-ish, business people sometimes they don't, uh, you know, they don't they don't know SQL, so they find it difficult. And when it comes to stream processing, it has to handle state. You know, the one hour one hour information means that you have a state. It may be in memory. Some stream processors use databases, whatever. But if the system goes down, there are problems. So how we handle that? And usually the systems need multiple nodes, so you want to scale that. Okay. So we need to support online learning. 
right? We have to learn when the data comes in. Or we want to support, usually, like if you want to support long-term aggregations, you can't keep one-year information in memory. That's inefficient. So how do you do that? Right? So those kind of aggregations. And then there's no visualization tools. So these are the problems in the streaming world. And what we try to do with WSO2 stream processor is to try to balance the streaming SQL capabilities. And we try to solve some of the uh, challenges alongside having the streaming SQL capability with us. So this is a very high level diagram of WSO2 stream processor, where it has a capability of collecting data, processing like we can do streaming analytics, streaming data integration, and all of the other stuff that we talked about. Uh, we can uh, predict some information. We can act. We can send it through APIs, call actions, send alerts, do visualizations, and also persist into a store or something like that. You process it and store. So how you can basically solve them? So the first thing that we did was, OK, we have this query editor, which is quite powerful. I'll do a demo on, on, on this tomorrow. So it has all the syntax highlighting. Or you can test it, run it, debug it, everything. You can do that there. But we also find some, some business users are finding it a little different, difficult, because it's a little advanced. So we also came up with a, a drag and drop query builder. So you can basically drag and drop and build the same SQL queries in a more visual way. So you can write the code, you can visualize it, the flow, or you can build the visual flow and do it. So if you are a beginner, you can start with this. And if you are quite familiar with SQL, you can do the other one as well. So it's, it's, it's best of both worlds. And then we have this problem, OK, even with this drag and drop stuff, some business users are finding it very difficult. So what we try to do is we try to give you some citizen integration experience. So as a developer, you build this app. You annotate that app saying, OK, these fields change. Let the business user change. Like, for example, if the threshold value, OK, let the business user change the threshold value. Or if it's the time of analysis, like one hour, the business user can change it to five minutes or 20 minutes, whatever that he likes. So make those, conf make those configurable. So we have uh, an editor to build a rule. And then it will ultimately, it gives you a form. So the, what the business user has to do is just fill the form. And all of these fields are auto can be validated. Like if you put a minus, minus five minutes, it, it says an error. So you can basically configure it that way. And we basically let your business users have the citizen integration experience of your enterprise right, by developer doing a little more step of, of making their uh, integration solutions a bit more uh, configurable. Right? So that's the way we can achieve, let the business users to reuse your system without calling you in the midnight and asking you, asking you to change the threshold values. Right? So that's much more efficient. And then with the democratization of stream processing, what we are basically trying to do is process the streaming to the edge. Right? So with the Siddhi engine that we have, we can embed that in any Java or Python program. So you can do the processing in the edge, in the application that you write, rather than sending all the information to the centralized system. Or if your system is not in Java or Python, or if you don't want to touch your system, we can work as a sidecar or as an edge device. Right? It, we can just si sit next to you, read your log files, and, say, and escalate the errors. Or we can be next to you and monitor your system health or, or any other information that you're pushing it out. So it can be locally processed. And if there are important information, then we can escalate them. So that is another way of doing it. So with this stream processor latest version, it is built on a microservices architecture. It's very fast. It just starts in within four seconds. So it, you can basically put um, um, bind that to any application and run it on that. So if you want to do ETL at the source, event routing, edge analytics, uh, and uh, the, all of those stuff, you can basically do with that. And if you want high availability, like that's, that's in the edge. Right? So if, as and well, if your node is there, it basically does processing. But if you want resiliency and high availability, we also have a true node architecture. So we are, one node would be active, and one node would be working as passive. And it basically do all the processing. So you don't need to have a phi node or a very complex system to start with. As and when the data grows, as based on your comment, you can find your, or you can pick your own architecture. So this has zero event loss. We can also support multi-data center support. 
And we, it also does periodic persistence. But even if both node goes down and come back, we have a way of recovery. So even without any data loss, like if you're using a messaging system like uh, JMS or Kafka or anything, we can recover without any data loss. So that is an amazing thing that we have. And if you really, really want to scale, then you have to build system like this, like you consume from the source, you do some processing, you put it to a, a, a queue, then you get it from that, you do some further processing. Likewise, you can just keep on adding different, different logic. So this is the way that you have to do it. If you want to do that, now you have to write all of those small, small application logic. And you have to maintain that. So that is some messy stuff. So what we try to do is we try to help you out. right? So this is the deployment architecture. So we have multiple stream processor workers that basically do all of these small applications. They connect to Kafka, and we are going to extend this for different other uh, messaging systems as well. As of now, we only have Kafka. And then we also have a job manager to manage this stuff and do a dashboard to visualize this data. So this is if you really want to go massively and scale your system. right? So here, what you basically do is you write your logic, and then you annotate the logic saying, OK, the first query, I want to run on four parallel nodes. The second query, I want to run on two parallel nodes. And the system will automatically wire them and deploy in something like uh, this architecture. So you really don't need to worry about it. The system will do all of all that for you. And it also gives you a monitoring dashboard to see, OK, how many nodes are running, which node is running which particular application, what does the overall topology look like, if there is a bottleneck, where is the bottleneck, all of those can be monitored and managed. So that's with this monitoring dashboard. So it gives you node level, CD app level, CD query level um, uh, view of the data. And with all of these, we have machine learning capability, online machine learning capability as well. We have clustering, classification, and regression, and anomaly detection on that. And we also have the capability of running long running uh, uh, aggregations, like aggregations from seconds to hours. So for example, uh, the light blue color one is the real time data. So you process some data in real time. You fetch some data from the disk. So you kind of merge and give you the real time information. So if you ask for all this data, the current day information will half processed real time, half come from the disk. And the previous days will come from the disk, because you are not going to modify that anymore. Right? You can basically store that in the disk. So we have that is the basic Lambda architecture. So we have built in the Lambda architecture for you so that all of those happen without any need of a big data storage. We can just work with RDBMS, and you can achieve, you can basically create this kind of chart with milliseconds accuracy on real-time data. Right? And then we also have visualization support. So some of the few stuff that we have compared to other dashboard providers is we have fine-grained access control, uh, dashboard level access, widget level access, data level access, like only logged in user can see his data, if you want to do that, those kind of stuff. And it also support localization, right? Every part of the UI is localizable. And integ widget communication and all of this other stuff are also there. So these are some business scenarios of stream processing. Uh, Event-driven data integration, real-time ETL, generating event streams from passive data. You have passive data, and you want to make them as a streaming stuff. Um, streaming data routing, notification management, real-time decision making, uh, KPI, manage, uh, KPI monitoring, citizen integration on streaming data, dashboarding and reporting. So all of these stuff are available. So we'll go into those stuff after this particular talk. So I'm almost uh, over time. So what you basically get with WSO2 Stream Processor is it is best suited for streaming data integration and streaming analytics use cases. It is lightweight. Uh, we also have a streaming SQL editor, a, a graphical editor. And you have multiple deployment options uh, based on your business need and based on your project. And we also support the streaming SQL and long running aggregations with citizen integration support. So this is all what you get with WSO2 Stream Processor. So so that's all from me, and thank you very much. Superb job, Suho, actually, you know, collecting and presenting all of this information within, you know, a limited period of time. And does, do we have any questions for Suho? We can perhaps take one or two right now, if you have any questions. OK, so we have two. Let's take the question from here. So could you uh, talk about some uh, example of data integration? 
real time data integration. What do you really mean by data integration? Because in the morning, uh, we spoke uh, that data integration is about putting data into the database as well. Are you talking about that or are you talking about something else? So, uh, so the question is, uh, uh, explain a little bit more on data integration. Like streaming data integration. So first thing is, Putting into the data lake is also one part of data integration. Like we have to collect data from multiple edge sources. If you want to put it to the data lake, you have to do some modifications before you put it. So you have to clean the data. You want to um, make it to a consistent format. So that is one way of doing it. The second way of doing it is like so you, that is like called real-time ETLs, extract, transform, and load. That is one use case. Now, another stuff is like, for example, if you have a notification management system, if you want to build that. So all the information that you come is in a streaming way. OK, you have, there's a notification is generated. So how you want to handle that ho the whole thing? Right? So it is an asynchronous information. So it passes through your system. You want to join with the database. You get your order enrich that particular message. Then you want to maybe ask a service, like whether you want to send this one to the user or not, whether he has subscribed, or if he has subscribed, if he has any rules, like when you want to al alarm him. So you basically check that, and you basically do that whole of those process before you send the alert to him. So getting a notification, a, a, a need for notification, and actually sending the notification itself, the whole process that you do in between is a streaming data integration. Because this data is coming on a streaming way that we want to send a notification. From that, how you, how you basically manage that and get it done. Right? So we are basically integrating an email system and the actual system that you want to send alerts on in a streaming way. So all the data that asynchronously implement, like asynchronous information, like if it may be monitoring data, system statistics, whatever, asynchronous information that comes into a queue like Kafka or JMS or anything, you can, you are basically doing something and calling some other stuff. It may be an alert, or it may be invoking another system based on a decision that you have taken, or it may be just enriching that information and passing along. All of those are, comes as streaming data integration.